keynote speaker today, I'm happy to uh, be able to introduce her. Sister Dorothea has traveled here from Jackson, Mississippi, just to speak to us. I mean, that's the only reason she's come to Memphis. So please give her a big hand and, uh, and welcome her. Wow, what a beautiful group of men here and a couple of ladies. I just, this is an honor for me to be here. And uh, thank you, Jim, for that uh, introduction. And also, what a beautiful testimony. We just need to trust God. That's the truth. And let me tell you how I got here. Thanks to Brian Schaefer. This spring, I think it was in March, I was at Bishop Copez's home to meet Father Nathan. And afterwards, I met Brian, his beautiful wife, and their daughter. We got talking about vocations. And of course, me and my big mouth, I started telling how I got to the convent. And I thought, oh. So Brian said, oh, you've got to tell that story. And so he said, I'm going to invite you to the men's club. I said, OK. So here I am. And first of all, I want to tell you about how I get my vocation story, and then tell you a little bit about myself, where I grew up, and also about our community. I'm a Springfield, Illinois Dominican from um, Illinois, one of these Yankees, but we were invited to come down to Jackson to run the old Jackson Infirmary, which is now St. Dominic Health Services. How many of you have seen St. Dominic's Health Services? Quite a few of you, okay. Well, let me tell you about my own personal story about how I got to be a Dominican sister. Um, I grew up in a small town not too far from Chicago, Illinois. I grew up in a beautiful, large family and a big farm. And my dad died when I was 13 years old. And my mom was a brave woman and she raised us and, and I was able to go to um, a Catholic high school, Catholic grade school taught by the Franciscans from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Then I went to the Sacred Heart Academy in Springfield, Illinois, run by Dominican sisters. I had a cousin, first cousin, who was a Dominican sister, and I would see her every summer when she'd come home to visit her mom and dad. And so I knew the Dominicans, and I got to grow fondly of them when I was taught by all the Dominicans, good education from the Franciscans and the Dominicans. Well, when I got out of school, I, of, course, I, of course, I was a party hound. I loved to dance. I loved to do all those fun things as teenagers and, and young adults. And anyway, I felt like I had a vocation, but I kept fighting it. I thought, I don't want to be a nun. I don't want to be a sister. You know, I don't want you know, to shut myself away. And so I kept fighting it, and, but it kept coming back. Well, anyhow, I was dating this uh, young man from the University of Illinois. And anyway, we were out at... And, um, we were dating and uh, just enjoying life, going to dances and all parties and stuff. And anyhow, one of my classmates had been to, and he was in the Newman Club there at University of Illinois, and they were having a party. And I wasn't there, but he was. And uh, so anyway, one of the girls there said uh, at the party said, you know, I heard that, that Dorothy was going to the convent. Well, he heard that. So anyhow, he came home, and we were on a date, and he said, I've got a question to ask you. And I said, oh, what's that, Don? He said, I heard you're going to the convent. And I swallowed big, and I said, well, I've been praying about it. I said, you know, I feel like I, the Lord's calling me, but I just am not ready. And I kept, you know, saying no. And, you know, like, you know, Lord has plans for you. And so, I, you know, like the hound of heaven, he kept, you know, calling me. And, and I kept saying no. And finally, when I said, Don, I'm praying about it. I think I might have a vocation, but I just don't think I, you know. And he said, well, you know, I think I have a priestly vocation. And he said, but I don't think I'm good enough. And that was a thing that turned me. I thought, if I'm keeping him from being a priest, I, that was when my deciding moment arrived. I said, if this is, I'm keeping him from being a priest. So I went ahead and I, I had taken papers out and took them back from the, from the um, powers to be at the mother house in Springfield. I you know, took them out once, I took them and pulled them back. And so I kept chickening out. So finally I said yes. So when he said that, I went ahead and applied. And I was accepted, and they accepted me. I thought, hallelujah. So anyhow, I went through novitiate and, and didn't pay any more attention to what happened to Don. Well, anyhow, Don went into the Air Force. He was over in France. And anyway, I was, after uh, I was professed, I was teaching first and second grade, and then I was asked to serve at a high school, Marion High School. And by the way, that sister that flipped through that ball last week, she's one of ours, and I taught at that school where she is now, Marion High School in Chicago Heights. Sister Mary Jo teaches there. Sister Mary Jo, who is going to throw out the first pitch, but with a little added extra. Look at this thing. A pretty good job of it. Throws it in the zone. Well, anyway, I was teaching up there, and, and I was running through the, the rec room one day, and we had a, my home diocesan paper was there, and I thought I'd flip through it real fast. 
And uh, sure enough, there was a picture of seminarians there from St. Bede's, and I thought, oh. And I looked to see who the seminarians were, and sure enough, there was Don. So he became a priest and, and uh, served very effectively as a good diocesan priest there in Peoria, Illinois, and Galesburg, and other places in Illinois. And I taught there in a cathedral in Springfield, and also taught in uh, Chicago Heights at high school. And then they asked me to go into health care. <clears throat> so I was. I went to Mary Chris College and uh, studied out in Iowa, and I was licensed to teach K through 12, which I did. I taught first and second grade at Cathedral in Springfield, and then I taught Chicago Heights at Marion High School. And then they asked me to go into health care. So I went back to uh, St. Louis U, and I became a dietitian, a registered dietitian. Well, I was finished, and they, prior to that, I was working at St. Dominic's in Jackson. Now let me back up and tell you a little bit about Saint, how our community came about. Back in the Civil War days, our sisters were in Springfield, Kentucky. That's where our community originated from, Springfield, Kentucky. We moved from Springfield, Kentucky to Springfield, Illinois. But during the Civil War days, the, all the convents there in the area were taking care of the soldiers, both Union and Confederate. And our sisters were out there on the battlefield bringing the soldiers into the convent and nursing them. So when, uh, in the meantime, up in Illinois, in, outside Springfield, Bishop Baltus had asked for some sisters to come teach the Irish immigrants right outside Springfield, Illinois, in Jacksonville. And so sisters from Springfield, Kentucky, there were six of them that came up and were sent up there to teach the immigrants. They thought they were going to go back to Springfield, Kentucky, so they didn't mind that. But when they got up there, they learned they're not going to go back to Springfield, Kentucky. They were going to start a new foundation in Springfield, Illinois. Well, about that time, and the sisters are from various countries, and one of them was, her father was a landowner in Virginia, and they owned the land where the capital is today. And so that was from Washington. But the sisters came up to Springfield, Illinois, and at that time, President Lincoln was assassinated, and his body was brought to Springfield, Illinois. And because of um, <clears throat> the sisters uh, taking care of the sick and the injured soldiers, both Union and Confederate, President Grant wanted someone there to unveil the statue of Lincoln. His body was brought to Springfield, the monument was built, and they had the statue of Lincoln there in Springfield where he is interred. And they wanted someone to, well, some of the sisters, to unveil the statue of Lincoln. And so, President Grant, somebody said, well, we can't get any sisters. The only ones that are here that are down in Springfield, Kentucky. And he said, and someone heard about the sisters from Springfield, Kentucky that had moved to Illinois. He said, there's some right here. And so President um, Grant said, send the coaches for them. I want them here to unveil the statue of Lincoln. So our two foundresses unveiled the statue of Lincoln. Their pictures are in the uh, Illinois Museum there of history there in Springfield. That's the story of our Springfield, Con Illinois, coming from Springfield, Kentucky. So we really do have southern roots, even though we're from Illinois. And uh, we like to claim that. And we are distantly related to the, <laughs> to the Springfield, to, to the roots. But now getting back to Jackson. <clears throat> so I was teaching. I was dietitian there for 20 years. Then I was elected to our mother house, and I was on the council, the leadership council for our members. And of course, our sisters are from all over. We teach in various places. We're California, all the way to New York. We have sisters who are psychologists, and we have missionaries down in South America, in Lima, Peru. I went down to visit them and to talk about poverty. We think we have poverty here in the country, nothing like they have there. But we have missionary sisters down there, and but we have sisters in Jackson. Now, how we got to Jackson, that's an interesting story. <clears throat> Michael Thomas is here, and he was my chauffeur today. We have a close relationship with the Thomas family from Jackson. Uh, Michael's uncle, Leon Thomas, was a very good man and very strong Catholic there. And he had a good friend named Jack Kennington. And Kennington was not Catholic, but he uh, ran the Kennington department store. Jack Kennington went out to New York to do some buying for his store. While he was out there, he got deathly ill, and he ended up in a Catholic hospital run by Catholic sisters. And he was so impressed with the wonderful care he got, he came back to Jackson, and all that was in Jackson at that time was Baptist Hospital. And then they had the old Jackson Infirmary that was terrible, it was run down, it was run by doctors. Now doctors are very good at do doing medicine, but when it comes to administration, they're not too good, but they, went to help. they needed some help. 
and they were ready to sell that place. Well, anyway, Jack Kennington was driving down with Leon Thomas one day, and he, he, they started talking about health care, and Jack Kennington said, you know, we got to get some Catholic sisters here in Jackson to run that old Jackson infirmary. Well, just then, Jack Kennington made a U-turn, and Leon said, where are we going, Jack? And he said, we're going to see your bishop. And so they went down to see Bishop Giroux. And of course, Bishop Giroux said, now what can I do here? And he said, well, we need some Catholic sisters to come and run this old Jackson infirmary. So they um, called, and Leon said, well, I don't know. He called and funded it to Father Brunini, who was just, a, he was father then. He turned out to be Bishop Brunini. But at that time, he was kind of like a rookie. And so they asked Bishop Brunini, to, or Father Brunini, to go scout around, see if he could find some Catholic sisters to run the old Jackson infirmary. So Bishop Bernini had a good friend who named, his name was Monsignor Jesse Gatton up in Illinois, Springfield, who happened to be our chaplain. Well, chaplain, and of course, they knew each other because of the Catholic Health Association. At that time, there was a Franciscan hospital over in Meridian, Mississippi, and there was a Catholic hospital over in Vicksburg run by the um, uh, Mercy Sisters. And so he knew that because of the Catholic Health Association out of St. Louis. So he called Monsignor Gatton and he said, hey, Jesse, he said, do you know of any sisters we could have down here? And so Monsignor Gatton went to our mother general and said, um, Sister Mildred was the mother general then, and she was in banking before she came to the convent. So she was a very astute businesswoman. And she said, well, what do we need here? And she said, well, we'll take on the... Um, We'll buy the place, but we're not taking on all the debt that the doctors had run up. So that was good. So we sisters came down, six of them, and we started working in the old Jackson Infirmary. Well then, <clears throat> when the, uh, they said, the sisters said, if we're going to stay here and give good health care, we've got to get out of this environment. It was downtown Jackson, run down, dirty, just mess. So the sisters were not familiar with the, the area yet. They came from Illinois. And, they sent some business leaders out to scout around for some property. And they did. The men came up with some property. But it was state property. When the state found out that it was for these Catholic sisters from the north, they said, no way, you can't buy that. But, but there's some property out in North Jackson you can buy. Now, that was, that was back in 1946. Okay. Now, back then, there was nothing out there, nothing. It was the boonies, and I guess they thought, if we buy that, they'll never see the sisters again. Wrong. Anyway, the sisters said, well, if that's all we can buy, we'll buy it. So we bought it. That was faith, I'm telling you. There was nothing out there. I mean, it's nothing. And um, so it was 13 acres. The sisters said, well, let's go ahead. And so we started. We built 100 bed. We shelled in some of it. And uh, <clears throat> so little by little, there was no road there. You had to walk to get to it. And you'd come down a, a, pave, a, a dirt road, and you could see the little structure there, but you couldn't get to it. Well, then University Medical Center built, and, but that is a state property right next to ours, and they built a road there to get to the University Medical Center and the School of Medicine. Well, pretty soon they made a little dirt road down to our place. Well, little by little, we got a paved road, and of course it stopped right there at St. Dominic's, where it is now, right by the interstate. There was no road there except just a paved road. Well, pretty soon, guess what? In the 70s, the interstate came by. And now, St. Dominic's is the most accessible health care in the whole state of Mississippi. It's right off the interstate. I mean, now we talk about a God thing. That's a God thing, right? Okay. I mean, we had no... Work of faith, because it started out with 13 acres, and now, today, we have over 3,500 employees, over 500 doctors who are board certified, 98% are board certified in their specialties. We have seven subsidiaries, of course, the hospital is the main one. We have 500 bed, 571 bed hospital. We have St. Catherine's Village, I don't know if you're familiar with that, it's the only licensed continuing care retirement center in the state. It is beautiful, it's on two lakes. It's out in Madison. Anybody been there? Have any relatives there? It's a continuing care. We have over 400 residents there. And it's a life care. And we have Cal uh, residents from New York to California. They're from all over. They Google, they say, this is the place to be, is in St. Catharines. And so we have St. Catharines Village. We also have the Caravan, which is a uh, it's community health services. And we have an outreach service. We have a large mobile, it's like a, cl a clinic on wheels. We have two registered nurses on that that go out into the uh, uh, poor areas and do screenings for the children. 
people, the kids, you know, they can't see and they can't hear, and the teachers think they're lazy, but so they can't hear or see. And so the nurses can get them into the health system, and our doctors help there. They can also check if they have scoliosis. We can get them in for doctors to surgeons, so that's important. Then we also go to the senior centers, and they do glaucoma checks. Now, these are in the poor areas of Jackson. We also, Sister Trinita is a licensed family nurse practitioner, and she runs a free clinic. She sees about 45 homeless patients a day at her clinic. It's down in the very poor area of Jackson, and uh, just does well. She has two people, three people work with her, another licensed nurse practitioner and a gentleman who's a kind of a person in intake and also kind of works as a guard because one of the people down there early was shot because of controlled drugs there. And so we have a person down there to do a dual role and then we have a phlebotomist. So those are the four people and she sees about 45 people a day. One morning she was down there very early by herself and she had locked herself in and she heard this and she said, who's there? And the voice said, room service. And it was a, a homeless man that came to bring her two stale donuts. I mean, it's just powerful, the stories, but she sees these homeless patients. She's a wonderful, wonderful diagnostician. She's so empathetic with these homeless patients. She can get them in, and we have doctors that come and volunteer their services. I commend the doctors for their volunteering. On their day off, they come down and work at that clinic, and cardiologists, the um, ophthalmologists, the dentists, and so on. So it's a wonderful service there. We also have a sports uh, club. We have uh, continuing, we have about uh, 5,000 members in our club that have uh, full physical, um, all the, it's a, it's a swimming pool, Olympic size swimming pool, um, all the machines that you need and everything. We have two places, one in Jackson and one in Madison. They have reciprocity for membership. And we also have New Directions, which is the um, uh, health and wellness for a senior population that are out and about. They go on trips, they do all kinds of things. Right now they're on their way to a mystery trip. They go on these trips. They just got back from Switzerland. But they also have doctors come and speak to them about all different health issues, Roman, Roman, uh, um, oh, arthritis, heart disease, you name it. We have wonderful doctors that give their time to tell these seniors how to live. We also have um, medical, we have medical associates. We have uh, 14 clinics. We also have telemedicine now. M Mississippi is a rural state. So we have a lot of small hospitals out there that have no access and of course, we have a high incidence of stroke and heart disease in Mississippi, and so we have neurologists and uh, neuro, uh, neurosurgeons, but we got this telemedicine now, which works wonders. We have people out in Carthage, and someone down there in Carthage or Kosciuszko, they think they're having a stroke or a coronary. The doctor there at their small hospital can call in, and we have a doctor right there in, in Jackson, and they can get on the um, the uh, C live, and they can tell them what to do, or if they, they give them that streptokinase and get them right there, or they can fly them in a helicopter to St. Dominic's. So it's a beautiful service. We have telemedicine, cardiology. We also have um, telemedicine for stroke patients. And we're number one in the stroke center for state of Mississippi. We also are very high in our oncology, our cancer services. We're uh, high rated there. So we have a wonderful service right there. And of course, St. Dominic's is the only Catholic health care facility in the whole state. The Mercy Hospital sold to a for-profit over in Vicksburg, and the other one in Meridian sold to a for-profit, and so there's no longer a Catholic hospital in either of those cities, so we're the only Catholic health care facility in the state, and uh, we're very blessed, very blessed with our mission and ministry we have. And we're very uh, diverse. We have all faiths, denominations. We have uh, Hindus, and uh, we have all the Jewish people, we have wonderful diverse boards, staff, medical staff, and patients. We have patients from all over. In fact, we had Pope John Paul II's cousin there. It's an interesting story. He, his family emigrated from Poland. They lived in Chicago, and this young man met us. He was in the Air Force and in his service, and he came down to Mississippi. He was stationed in, there in the, um, the, one of the bases there in Mississippi, and he met this young woman from Mississippi. And um, anyway, uh, he married her. But then he was out in California, and when he retired from the military, he moved back to Jackson area because his mother-in-law and father-in-law had a uh, farm there. Well, he was living there, and he had a heart attack, and so he came to St. Dominic's, and our cardiologist said, Sister, we got the Pope's cousin here, Pope John Paul II, <laughs> Casimir, and the Pope. So anyhow, it was interesting, but that was interesting. We've had some interesting people. We had the Shah of Iraq there, Iran, as a patient. We've had uh, Jackie Onassis' uh, interior design coordinator there, and uh, so we had some notable people there, but all our patients are notables, and they're very special to us because that's our prime service, that's our mission. We take care of all people, no matter if they can pay or they can't pay. 
Uh, last year we had like 17 million in charity care, so that's pretty good for a, for a small hospital small hospital. But anyway, we also have a sports medicine, and um, that's another part of our, we have 14, 15 clinics out there, family medicine clinics. So we're far reaching, and so that's our mission and ministry. I would, and I know you're on a, a time limit, but I'm going to finish with a little story. And first of all, I want to just commend you. I think this is marvelous. In this day and age, you know, we're a Catholic church, and we're hitting, getting hit right now, and it's a hard time. But, you know, I commend you people. You are ambassadors for the faith. You're here to stand up for the faith. We're the one true church. And like Sunday's gospel, you know, Jesus said, will you leave me too? And Peter said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so, therefore, where will we go? This is it. And you read the Catholic his, uh, church of the, uh, Church's history, we've gone through many storms before. But we stake in there and we're in the true church and so we're going to stay strong. But we need good ambassadors like you Catholic men. I just commend you for this. This getting together, you know, we have fellowship and you have you know, share stories, you're a faith witness. This is beautiful. And you give me hope and you give me uh, so much inspiration. And I just want to say thank you for inviting me here today. It's been very, very inspiring for me. I do want to finish with a story. A few years ago, a group of salesmen went to a regional sales meeting in Chicago. They had assured their wives that they would be home in plenty of time for Friday night's dinner. In their rush to catch the plane home, and with tickets and briefcases, one of these salesmen inadvertently kicked over a table which had a display of apples. Apples flew everywhere without stopping or looking back. They all managed to reach the plane in time for their nearly missed boarding, all but one. He paused, took a deep breath, got in touch with his feelings, and experienced a twinge of compassion for the girl whose apple stand had been overturned. He told his buddies to go on without him, <coughs> waved goodbye, told one of them to call his wife when they arrived at their home destination and explain his taking a later flight. Then he returned to the terminal where the apples were all over the terminal floor. He was glad he did. The 16-year-old girl was totally blind. She was softly crying, tears running down her cheeks in frustration, and at the same time helplessly groping for her spilled produce as the crowd swirled about her, no one stopping and no one to care for her plight. The salesman knelt on the floor with her, gathered up the apples, put them back on the table, and helped organize her display. As he did this, he noticed that many of them had become battered and bruised. These he set aside in another basket. When he had finished, he pulled out his wallet and said to the girl, Here, please take this $50 for the damage we did. Are you okay? She nodded through her tears. He continued on with his, I hope we didn't ruin your day too badly. As the salesman started to walk away, the bewildered blind girl called out to him, Mister, he paused and turned to look back into those blind eyes. She continued, are you Jesus? He stepped in mid stride and he wondered. He gently went back and said, no, I am nothing like Jesus. He is good, kind, caring, loving, and would never have bumped into your display in the first place. The girl gently nodded. I only asked because I prayed for Jesus to help me gather the apples. He sent you to me. Thank you for hearing, Jesus, mister. Then slowly he made his way to catch the later flight with that question burning and bouncing about in his soul. Are you Jesus? Do people mistake us for Jesus? That's our destiny, is it not? To be so much like Jesus that people cannot tell the difference as we live and interact with a world that is blind to his love, his grace, and his life. If we claim to know him, we should live, walk, and act as he would. Knowing him is more than simply quoting scripture and going to church. It's actually living the word as life unfolds day by day. We are the apple of his eye, even though we, too, have been bruised by a fall. 
He stopped what he was doing and picked up you and me on a hill called Calvary and paid in full for our damaged fruit. I just want to say thank you again for inviting me to be here today. And as I said before, you inspire me. So keep on being ambassadors for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, gentlemen.